for the invitation to come up here. Um, I've been um, active um, in Scarborough before, 18 months ago. We were standing in the high street, yes, handing out the leaflets. Then we had a branch meeting here. Um, I would say, um, what a splendid little town you've got here. Um, when you walk, when you come out the railway station, you walk up and down the high street, you know you're in Britain. Um, the shops are all British, the people are all British. You feel safe and secure, you feel amongst your own. Somebody coming from the capital of our country, yeah. that's a novel yeah. feeling. I come from one of the big cities, and it's a novel feeling coming to such a charming little town. Coming to such a charming little town. Um, let me say, I followed the first speaker with great interest. It is very correct <clears throat> to acknowledge that there is a sort of genius in us British people. It sort of diffused amongst us. But as the first speaker said, the Industrial Revolution um, came out of the British people. This modern world that we live in, our whole modern standard of living, including the fact we've got electric lights um, and electric powered trains um, and trains itself, all comes out of us British. And as the first speaker said, it was the Cornish engineer, Trevitnik, I think his name was pronounced, Trevitnik, who in 1814 got the first steam locomotive rolling along. Um, it was Sir Robert, Ste Sir Robert Stevenson who, who then devised a proper working railway system. Um, I don't want to go into all the engineering of building railway trains, but there were some very, very fundamental questions I had to overcome to build steel, to build steam-powered trains. Even the, even the obvious thing of a steel wheel on a railway line, on a track, is not an obvious thing. And there was a British genius that conceived building these trains. Uh, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you come out of Euston Station, not King's Cross, but Euston at London, there's a statue to Robert Stevenson. He's only about 55 when he died, because I've no doubt he's under tremendous pressure. The fact is, the British conceived steam trains and railways, along with many other inventions, and the British had so much energy in that time that in, in addition to covering Britain with railway lines, we built a greater track of railway line in, in British India than we actually built in Britain. Now we covered Britain in track, we built a greater length in India itself, and we also covered South, um, South America with railway track. We had so much energy in those days, um, and I'm glad that that was acknowledged by the first speaker. One could give an umpteen speeches about engineering. Engineering is, a, is the basis of our life. Um, however, what I'd like to talk about today, uh, when Trish invited me up here, um, I've said what a charming little town you have here. Um, well, in London, our capital, as you know, Siddiqui Khan, an Asian, a Muslim, the son of Pakistani immigrants, has got himself elected mayor of our capital. I don't want to go off on a, on a tangent to the United States of America, but as a British person, I never thought that a Negro, with all respect to Obama, with all respect to the President of the United States of America, I never thought that a black man would become the President of the United States of America. I never actually thought that would happen. And I never actually thought in my naivety that uh, a Pakistani would become the, Lord, the mayor of our capital city. Uh, I never thought that in the past. But I will tell you, I have been, um, I joined the National Front 40 years ago. I've never regretted a second of being an active nationalist. Um, and I've always known that the British people needed to take the, the subject of immigration very, very seriously. Okay, it just starts off with a few. But, um, okay, I'll, I'll tell you a little joke. A clean joke. Uh, it goes like this. Once upon a time, once upon a time, there were two Chinese. Once upon a time, there were two Chinese. Now look how many there are. Get it? 
So I joined nationalism 40 years ago because I could see the dangers of immigration. If there's a few immigrants, just a f we were told then there's only a few immigrants. There's only a few immigrants. If you only let a few in, why don't they get a little few more in, a few more in, a few more in? I tell you, the upshot is, it is shocking that, a, that the son of Pakistani immigrants should now be the mayor of our capital city. It's shocking. But for somebody who lives in the city, it is not surprising because the fact is there's been so much immigration into Britain, we have been so betrayed in this country that now we British people are now a minority in our own capital. That's how, that's the measure of the betrayal. And I'm speaking here of London where I've spent most of my life, but I'm well aware that I could be speaking of Birmingham, Leeds. Manchester, Bradford, Leeds, our major cities. On the New York. There has been such a betrayal of, of us that now you have got an Asian block vote in many of our British cities. Yeah. An yeah. Asian bloc vote has been allowed in by the traitorous politicians who have been flooding us against the will of the British people, have been flooding us with millions and millions and millions of foreigners to such an extent now that the son of a Pakistani immigrant can get himself voted in as the Mayor of London. Um, coming here, before I came to this pub, I came off the railway station, had a bit of time, walked up and down, as I did last time I was, when I was active, was handing out these leaflets. I had a very friendly reception, it's a very friendly town this, you know, we stood there for an hour, didn't we, or maybe an hour and a half last time. Uh, had a very friendly reception, people are very ready to take the leaflets, yes, 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 yes. Um, later on I'm going to be talking about some leaflets, because I've got some freebie leaflets up, which I've brought up here. They've all been paid for, so just take them. But, here you can describe your town as a British, a British town, a civilised town and a decent town, but the fact is, and this has been building up for a long time in, in London. London, British civilization is under threat. British civilization is under threat in our capital. Um, if you travel on the public transport, you can be the only white British person on the bus. You can travel in one of the sort of suburban trains that rattle around, and you can be the only white person in the carriage. Um, in large parts of London, um, you don't see British people. The streets, are, the streets are full of arrogant aliens. They're pushing and shoving. They're all jabbering away in their own tongues. With never, you never to hear a, plea, a please or a thank you. In many parts of London, the Muslims are now pushing for Sharia law to be set up. Um, the crowds on the street are dressed as if they've just come down the Khyber Pass, Afghanistan. Um, the women are wearing white veils covering their faces. Other women are wearing the burqa head to foot in black, head to foot with this little slit to look through. A most alien, not to say threatening sight to see that. To see a whole street like that. The situation is very, very dangerous. What you're seeing building up is the alien takeover of Britain. There are mosques and temples dominating our towns, dominating our town centres. I'll tell you, I was raised in West London. My father worked for London Transport and I had a happy childhood. I was brought up in the 1950s. I had a happy childhood and I thanked my parents for my happy childhood. And I tell you, my motive for doing this is that in a hundred years from now, there will be happy white British children in this country uh, enjoying, the ha enjoying a, a, a childhood as happy as I had when I had, was a child some 50 years ago. I will never know those children and they will never know me. But I do it so that there will be happy, children, happy English white British children in this country 50 years from now, which they certainly won't get if this continues as it does now. Yeah, yeah. They certainly won't get that. So, the Britain that I was raised as a child 
the London that I was raised in a child, um, that is in the past tense and that is my motivation for um, campaigning now. Um, the election of Sadiqi Khan, that came as no surprise to us. Um, the politicians have flooded us with millions and millions and millions of foreigners. Um, he was enabled, Sadiqi Khan was enabled to be get elected Mayor of London because of the millions who have been let into this country, the millions who have been given a vote to vote in our country, and so we are watching, um, we are watching this situation. Um, I tell you, when I, when I first joined this part, I joined nationalism 40 years ago, people used to say to us then, they were very, very naive, they said to us then, oh, um, it's not as bad as you say, it's not as bad as you say, it's not as bad as you say. Um, they used to say to us, they were so naive, people were so naive, they would say to us, oh, the Labour Party is on the side of the working class. That's what they used to say to us. The Labour Party is on the side. Well, that's a lie that's been exposed. They would say to us, the Tory Party is going to stop immigration. I'm talking now the 1970s, the 1980s, the 1990s. What a lie that turned out to be. How, what a lie that was exposed. Um, every prediction that the National Front has given, every warning that the National Front has issued um, has been justified. Um, the National Front has been right from day one. The National Front has been right for 50 years. Um, next year, 2017, the National Front will be celebrating 50 years, its 50 year anniversary. Um, the National Front Directorate is planning to suitably commemorate and mark the 50th anniversary of our party. Um, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, even 30 years ago, people would say to us, no, no, mate, it's not like that. Um, but no one can say that now. No one can say, um, they can all see the problem now. They can all see the problems. Um, the question is, the question is, does a great people, does a great people that created this modern world, the first speaker, it's not an obvious thing to build a steam train. It took a certain genius, I can tell you, Building the first steam trains was not an easy thing to do. The first trains used to explode and kill the crews because they didn't understand the pressure of steam. Um, the first train that ran from Manchester to Liverpool killed the man in front with the red flag. That was the first out. I was a bit sad. But a people that can persevere and create the basis of the modern world, which is what we have done, you know, the first speaker spoke about railway trains. I've spoken about the fact that we covered Britain in railway trains and built train railway track in half the world. We also played a major role in creating um, aircraft. It's not obvious that planes can fly. You look at these huge jets that people go on holiday on and you might well wonder what keeps the thing which weighs about 100 tonnes up in the air. After all, you know, that drops easy enough. 100 tonnes you'd think would drop even heavier. So, I join this movement and I know that you attend these meetings and give up your time to attend these meetings, perhaps in curiosity to hear what we've got to say, perhaps because you know what we're going to say and that you know that we're right. Um, we have faith in the British people. We have faith that the British people will deal with these politicians. The politicians, I won't say why they do what they do. I won't look into their brains. But the fact is, 
The politicians have lied to us for 40 years. The Conservative Party has won every general election since 1959 on the lie that they will stop immigration. Listen, I can, I can t prove what I'm saying to you. I happen to be 73 years of age. I was born in 1943, in the middle of the Second World War. Um, in 1959, I happened to be 16 years of age. In, in, the, in the 1950s, I was living in West London with my parents. My father worked for London Transport. I was living in West London. And we started having these exotics from the tropics walking down our high street. Sikhs with coloured turbans, yellow turbans and blue turbans and brown turbans and all colours under the sun turbans. And British, they were utterly alien, utterly alien. And we living in our little suburb of West London, Hounslow, couldn't understand what they were doing here. What, what did they come to argue? What they're doing it? And there was a great deal of unrest. The British people in the 1950s did not want coloured immigration. They didn't want it. They knew all about the problems of the colour bar in the United States of America. They knew all about the Jim Crow laws. They knew all about the race riots in the United States of America. They didn't want race riots in Britain. They didn't want race problems in Britain. And in the 1950s, people did not want to be burdened with the problems of the race problems of South Africa, the, the United States of, the, of America, or anywhere else. Now, the Tories, who are the wickedest liars the world's ever seen, the Tories, in 1959, knew there was tremendous opposition to the coloured immigration. So how did they deal with that? They went to the electorate in 1959 and said, we Conservatives, we vote for us and we will stop immigration. And we were so naive. They won a tremendous, a tremendous um, uh, election. They won by a tremendous majority in 1959 on the slogan that we Conservatives will stop immigration. The Tories have, they, the Tories have, every general election that the Tories have won since 1959, they have won by what they call amongst themselves, they're utterly cynical, amongst themselves, they call it playing the race card. We will stop immigration. In 59, Harold Macmillan won the general election in 59 by promising um, to stop immigration. In 1970, Ted Heath promised to stop immigration and got elected in 1970. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher won the general election by promising to get elected, uh, by promising to stop immigration. Um, the latest creep and trash and traitor, um, John um, David Cameron, won the 2010 general election. He won the 2010 general election by saying, we will reduce Change of, just a change of phrase, you know. A little, a little, a little yeah. touch of reality here, that, that just in case they're starting to clue up outside. We will reduce immigration down to a few 10,000 a year. Reduce to a few 10,000 a year. He won the, he got himself elected at number 10 Downing Street in um, 2010 on that promise. Last year, they let in a record 300,000. Such liars are they, such liars, such liars. Um, the question arises, will a British people tolerate this? Will a great people like the British people tolerate their country being taken away from them by these liars, professional liars? Will a great people, um, there's 55 million of us, there are 55 million of us. I'll tell you, going back to Siddiqui Khan's election, there are, there are 5 million voters in London, just over a million voted for Siddiqui Khan. Just under a million voted for the other creep, the Tory millionaire Goldsmith, yeah? That leaves three million who wasted a vote or didn't vote. The turnout was less than 50%, actually. I have no doubt that when the British people um, get their act together, um, they will remove from public office these politicians. Um, I have no doubt that will come. Uh, I will expand the uh, 
focus a little bit beyond the national front as it is at the moment. Um, I will remind you, a number of us in this room, certainly including me, were in the British National Party at one time. Um, I happen to be a founder member of the British National Party, as I happen. I've been around, that's a long time, been around several times actually. <laughs> never regretted a second. I have never regretted a second of being, an, I don't know anything more important than what we're doing. You know, we could, this election of Siddiqui Khan, I'm not only focusing on it because it's happened this month, but it is a, a wake-up call, there's no doubt about it. There's no doubt about it. I'm talking, I'm talking London, but I'm talking also Birmingham, Manchester, Bradford, Leeds. Um, in the British National Party, uh, in the general election of 2010, got almost a million votes. The British National Party one time had a hundred elected councillors. Okay, the British National Party had problems, but that's another story, I'm not going to talk about that. But the fact is, the British National Party got a million votes, in, or just short of, let's say, a million votes at the general election of 2010. Had a hundred elected councillors, some really wonderful people up in the north of England. Um, at the general election last year, I stood as a National Front candidate in the general election last year. Um, I happen to live in a town in London called Sutton. Um, I stood in one part of Sutton for the National Front, and where I happen to live, there was no Nationalist candidate. So I will tell you, quite frankly and candidly, I voted UKIP at the general election. I stood as a National Front candidate in one part of Sutton, in the part of Sutton where I live, I voted UKIP because I wanted to be part of that four million vote who voted UKIP. Mm -hmm. Now, in the last 50, 60 years, because there has been growing um, resentment in this country against um, the, the Westminster traitors, um, at by-elections there have been sometimes dramatic swings against whatever parties in power, yeah? Um, never before at a general election of four, never before at a general, at a general election they've all gone back to mummy and daddy, yeah? They've all gone back to map of mummy and daddy. The first time that general election last year, four million voted UKIP, including one vote from me. That's the first time you had a major push against um, the Westminster establishment. And we're getting, this cut, we're getting this referendum on the 23rd of June simply on the back of the four million votes that UKIP got last year. Um, I'm not a member of UKIP. There's a lot about UKIP I don't approve of. They have lots of ethnic candidates. That's a total no-no for me. Um, the ethnics belong in their own country. They certainly don't belong in representing us. Um, um, but there is four million votes uh, against the system. Um, I was talking in the interval about what's going on in the United States of America. The US of A has got the same problems as we've got. They've got a massive immigration from Mexico. They've got massive crimes in their cities. Massive crimes. Um, and the American establishment is selling out the American working class. They're, they've outsourced millions of jobs to China because it's so the Chinese are worth a pennies in the pound. Wall Street, the people who run Wall Street, are selling out America, just like the city of London is selling out this country. Yeah. At one time, we used to make everything we needed. Um, yeah, yeah. We make everything from your underwear upwards, yes. Now it all comes from China. Um, the first speaker was talking about how we... How we Created the railway system. I and mean, made a lot of jobs and industry. Oh. Jobs for British people need railways. I know. And now Crew, look at Crew, 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 town like Crew decimated. Decimated. Everyone you see is foreign. Yeah, yeah. They're exactly. not from Crew, the Polish. Yeah, well, sure. Railway towns which give full employment. You don't have any full employment now, do you? We are being betrayed. We are being betrayed in Britain, and the parallel is being done in the United States of America. And they've got a, they've got a hero in America. God bless the man, oh, Donald yes, Trump, yes. a real hero, a real hero, a real hero, who is sweeping, sweeping the vicious, wicked establishment to one side and has got the support of millions and millions and millions of decent, patriotic, hard-working Americans who don't want to be sold out and don't want to be the victims of crime and don't want their countries flooded with millions of foreigners. Um, so, there is, um, the whites are waking up 
we always knew they would wake up. They've been waking up in stages. Um, one of the things that we achieved when Derek, when we, one of the things that we achieved in the British National Party, excuse me, was um, um, when was it? Nine, when was '93? How many longer? What's that? What are we now? 2016. 23 years ago. I used to be a maths teacher, but I don't want to get one time. <laughs> but at the moment, I'm into history of politics, so I had a bit of a job with the adding up there. 23 years ago, we in the BNP, again, again in London, right? In East London, a real suffering part of London. Um, we got the first nationalist councillor elected. Um, that was a breakthrough. That was a breakthrough. Because I tell you, the left is used to say to us, uh, you'll get so many votes, but you'll never win a seat. You'll never win a vote. You'll never win a seat. Never win a vote. And the fact is, we're all human beings. You think, a, mm, I wonder if we ever will win. You know, we do well, but will we ever win? But then, with Derek Beacon standing on the Isle of Dogs, London Barrow Tower Hamlets, um, we won this seat. We worked very, very hard, had a lot of problems, um, but we won. And it, it, you know, that's one of the high spots of my life in nationalism, winning that seat with Derek Beacon. Because it's like as if you break a bad magic spell, yeah? You've got a bad black spell against you, you break it. And you, you know, because you wondered, did, were these lefties right? Were these Tory snobs right when they said to you, well, the, the lefties would do it a fist and the other lot would do it a disdainful, a disdainful you. And you'll never win. We did win. We did win. It went all around the world. Um, it was a tremendous victory and it gave us heart. And from then, um, you had some tremendous victories in the north of England, in Burnley, Lancashire, and then right across the north, and then elsewhere, and to one extent, the BNP had 100 elected councillors. So, with the election of Derek Beacon, and then the others in Burnley, elsewhere, that very brave woman in Rotherham, very brave woman, um, what's her name? Marley. What was it? Marlene Guest. Marlene Guest. Yeah, she yeah. was one brave woman. She was yeah, in a snake yeah. pit, also known as a council chamber, a snake yeah, pit, yeah. on her own, one BMP yeah, councillor, yeah. Marlene Guest. And she was trying, she was exposing the yeah. wicked crimes being committed by these criminal Asian grooming gangs. Yeah. The criminal, yeah. the vile. She was attempting to expose the crimes committed by the vile, criminal, Asian grooming gang. And the wicked Labour Party said, no, 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 There's, no, 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 um, Marlene, you've got it wrong, you've got it wrong, you've got it wrong. But Marlene Guest and others persevered, yeah. and the wicked cover-up organised by the Labour Party was exposed, starting in Rotherham, in those other northern towns, Burnley, Rochdale, Blackburn, down to Birmingham, yeah. Far south as Dover, actually. It was exposed that the Labour Party had known all about that children, we're talking about children here, children being abused most vilely. And the Labour councillors and the Labour Party knew all about the vile crimes being committed. And that was charted by Marlene Guest in Rotherham and then taken up by the nationalist movement. Well, I believe, look, I, I, I use the word, I believe, I have no doubt, that a wonderful people, like the British people, uh, will sort this problem out. We have a political problem. We have a political problem with the three major parties. They're, they're absolutely rotten. They, 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 they have been, the Tories, the Tories have been lying to us since 1959. They cynically call it the playing the race card. Margaret Thatcher, I know I'm going back, but it's all burnt in my mind, actually. Even go back to Enoch Powell's government, which were letting them in. Enoch Powell was the man who, who stood up for the British people. Look, I joined the National Front in 1973. Enoch Powell made his great speech in 1968, in which he said we must be mad, mad, with piling up our own funeral pyre. Now, I've told you that I was brought up as a child in West London. My father worked for London Transport. As it turned out, as it happens, 
my father, my parents voted Labour because they were a working class, they saw themselves as patriotic working class people, and they just voted Labour in the same way as in those those days, it was about 60 years ago. We used to have the Daily Mirror in our house. I wouldn't look at the Daily Mirror now, but in those days, it was a serious sort of newspaper, and it was the working class paper. And, but my father, who was no fool, said to me back in 1968, he said, if Enoch Powell is not thrown out the Tory party, I, your father, will vote Labour, will vote Tory for the first time in his life. But he was a shrewd man. In their wickedness, in their wickedness. The Tory leader, Ted Heath, said, I, Ted Heath, turn, I, turn a face of stone to racism. Now what is racism? Racism is long live the white race. I have been asked by journalists, they said to me, uh, are you a racist? Are you a racist? I, look, they ask you a question, always ask a question back. That's a technique. I've been asked, are you a racist? I say, if by that term, if by the term racist is meant, am I concerned about the welfare and the future of the British race? The British race is traditionally dis de de defined the peoples of the British Isles and whatever um, Europeans have merged in over the, over the years. Uh, if, by that term, am I concerned about the future and the welfare of the British race, then yes, I am concerned about the future and welfare of the British race. That's quite legitimate. But, but that word racism, which happened to be invented by Leon Trotsky, if you know who Leon Trotsky was, um, communist, real name Lev Bronstein, I won't go into the religious aspect at the moment, maybe another occasion. But Lev Bronstein, also known as Trotsky, invented that term in the 1920s, complete meaningless garbage term. We say long live the white race, do we not? Long live the white race, long live the British race, that's good enough for me. But Ted Heath in his hardness, with his, with his heart of stone, Ted Heath said, I, I turn a face of stone against racism. All that meant was that Enoch Powell and all the millions of decent people who did not want this country turned into a Suspect. what it is now. Whereby, whereby our major cities are now multiracial, multi criminal, permanent riot zones of nightmares, of cities where nobody would want to live or nobody would want to raise a family. That's what they've done to us. And in fact, um, just broadening out the focus, that's exactly what, what is being done to American cities with crime and immigration, what is being done in France and Germany, but particularly since we're British and we focus on our British problems, what has been done by these politicians. Um, the like our local communities. Sorry? Like our local communities, aren't they? They're destroying us. Yeah. They're destroying us. A, a, we don't stand together anymore. Because we are destroyed. I have, destro I have described to you what large parts of London is like. There is no community in large yeah. parts of London. Because community means that we have things in common, yeah? yeah? When, when you've got half the world in your street and it's a Tower of Babel, and a lot of them, some of them look at you as contempt, as an idiot, yeah? Because you've let all this lot march around like conquering heroes in your town. Yeah. And you've got to live there, and you've got to live there. Then our communities are being destroyed because there isn't. A community means we've got something in common, as we have in this room. But a community yeah. such as you get... But with the election of Derek Beacon, we proved that we could fight back, that we could win, I might say. But that's a godforsaken area where we got him elected 23 years ago. That is where they are now um, enforcing Sharia law. That is where they're enforcing Sharia law. That's where you see women wearing the veil. That's where you see women wearing the fur, yeah, head to foot in black. Uh, utterly threatening, utterly alien, with absolutely nothing in common with us, and everybody knows it. Um, I would like to give credit here. In this month, um, in this month, the National Front put up candidates. We are a British party 
and it pleases me greatly to say that we had candidates right across Britain. We had candidates standing in England, we had candidates standing in Wales, we had candidates standing in Scotland. Um, it's very, very pleasing. Um, it was very good that our former chairman, Kevin Bryan, who was involved in a very serious road accident last year and luckily survived, he crashed into a bus, very lucky to survive that, that Kevin, standing in Rochdale, had the good fortune not to have a UKIP standing against him, so Kevin got, I think, 10 or 11% of the vote, which is a nice thing to start off with. Um, most, of, most of the rest of our candidates um, had to compete with UKIP, I'll say a few, uh, and UKIP at the moment are getting the majority of the vote. I'll come back to UKIP in a minute. Um, I myself stood for the National Front, um, uh, and uh, I got a thousand votes. I stood in my town, Sutton and Croydon in South London, and a thousand local people uh, voted for me. Um, there's my leaflet, and that's the thing. We want our country back. That, I think, actually is the National, is the National Front slogan. We want our country back. Um, we put out 10,000 of these. Um, coming back to UKIP, there's this vote next month on the 23rd of June where we are campaigning. We have these leaflets here. There's a whole load of them over there. Um, it's a bit of an aggressive leaflet. Suck it is a bit of a harsh sort of word, and it says, you were suckered in 1975, don't be suckered this time. The idea is to attract, you know, people get umpteen stuff out of boxes, umpteen stuff comes through. Um, and this is to say, what are you talking about? But the fact is, I was involved, the National Front was involved in 1975, uh, and that, that, that was won then by lies. Ted Heath was a Prime Minister, Ted Heath said, this is not about politics. It's just about trade. We want to trade with France and Germany and Italy, and they want to trade with us. There's no, polit there's no political agenda. There's no political agenda. That was an absolute lie, and that's, it was on that lie that Teddy persuaded people to vote. We now have the experience, and I do hope the British people on the 23rd of June understand what's at risk here. What's at risk? is the protection of our, of our frontiers, the borders. I tell you, the people, the people, I get people still saying to me, the politicians are mad. They're not mad. They are heartless and wicked beyond words. And I tell you, just in case you wonder where we're heading for and where the politicians are heading us for, we're heading for something like Brazil, actually. Now, Brazil, which has an enormous population, about 200 million, um, which is at least one third Negro, former slaves, one third mixed race, uh, blacks, South American Indians. <coughs> um, you've got at the top, you've got one percent in Brazil are billionaires. They're the big boys, billionaires. They don't have cars; they can fly around in uh, helicopters, of course. Then underneath them, you've got millionaires. That's two or three percent. Then underneath them, you get. Perhaps 30% of the population are whites, or mostly whites, and they're the ones who do the work from being engineers and doctors to, I don't know, train drivers. They're the ones who do the work. And underneath them, you've got the underclass, the frightening underclass. And in a country like Brazil, believe me, you sweat every day not to lose your job, because if you lose your job, you can't pay your, your mortgage, you can't pay your rent, you fall into the underclass. But meanwhile, those at the top, the billionaires who fly around in, in, in jets and helicopters, and the millionaires who drive around in armoured cars, because it's so much crime in Brazil, that is where logically we're heading for. And all these politicians see themselves as the good boys and the good girls, we're going to get the, the bunces at the end of the day and that they're going to end up millionaires, if not billionaires. You may well know that Tony Blair is a, a multi-millionaire. And they're, they're well paid off, these creeps. So when someone like Merkel, the mad chancellor of Germany, invites the whole of the world, including terrorists, child molesters, murderers, muggers, the whole lot into Germany, into Europe, she is not mad. She is carrying out an agenda to turn Germany, to turn Europe, and it all swamps over here. And in parallel, 
they're doing it here, the Labour Party, the Tory Party, to turn us into a Brazil on the North Sea, whereby you've got this horrendous, horrendous underclass, you've got the white sweating, sweating, sweating to keep the job, not to lose the job, to pay the mortgage, pay the rent, and on top of it, you get the billionaires and the millionaires. Now that is the future of the white race, and that is the agenda, and that's why Merkel is inviting the whole world into Germany, into us. And I tell you, my last, before I wrap up, I will say, that it's my faith, my faith, that we will, um, I believe the white race, particularly the, the British race, which plays a key role in all this, will lead the, um, the fight for our salvation. I believe that. I, I, could, I couldn't be in this movement if I didn't know that we was going to win. But I know, partly through what the first speaker said, we are a great people. We're not just anybody. So, look, I just come to my conclusion now. I've got some papers over there which I brought up. Do we want, we've, we've just got the Mayor of London, we've now got an Asian Mayor of London. Do we want an Asian Prime Minister of Great Britain? We all say no. But Mr Cameron wants an Asian Prime Minister of Great Britain. Two years ago, the President of India visited Britain and this creep here, this shameless, grovelling, crawling oh, wow. creep, the Prime Minister, Mr Cameron, told the President of India on his official visit two years ago that he, Cameron, was looking forward to the day when an Asian was Prime Minister of Great Britain. So they're over there, just take them, they've all been paid for. The other paper I'll advertise is, um, do we want multiracialism? No, we don't. We don't want our cities given to the third world, but the Labour Party certainly does want their cities given to the third world. Um, we've got these leave leaf leaflets over here, of them to you, so that you just take them. And just, I'll just finally, pro I'll make a promotion here. I will promote, every year, for the last 48 years, the National Front has been invited to lay a wreath at the Cenotaph on Remembrance Day. Now, for every year, for the last 48 years, that's a tremendous privilege and an honour. Our party, our party has a very interesting history. It was founded, I don't know if you know who founded the National Front. The National Front was founded by some very top individuals. Two of them were army generals, another was an air commodore, Another was a, a, an admiral of the British Navy. Others were Oxford, uh, Oxford um, scholars. They founded the National Front. And they applied for and were given the right to lay a wreath at the Cenotaph on Remembrance Day Sunday. And that tradition has been maintained for 48 years. Um, and I t it is... It is very well organised. We've got the drummer here at the back, that man there who bangs the big drum. We, we does a very good job, a very good job, because that drum beat really puts your heart into you. You're not just struggling, you're not just strolling down the strand, as they say. They are marching, and the flags are flying, the drums are beating. We line up just across the road from Victoria Railway Station. We line up, all are organised by the police, of course. There's a few bobbies there. We then march down Victoria Street, and because it's like a, like a canyon with all these sort of huge office blocks, it really echoes all the way down. Uh, and the flags, are, we've been very lucky in recent years, the flags will fly, we make a film of it every year, um, and we march through the historic, we march through the historic part of London, we march past Westminster Abbey, where the last thousand years, the King's the coronation of the kings and queens have been celebrated. We march around Parliament Square, past Parliament, which is the political centre of Britain. We then march into Whitehall, lay our wreath at the Cenotaph. We lay several leaves, wreaths at the Cenotaph. Then we march off and we're given space. There's a there's a, um, park land by, on the embankment by the River Thames there, and we're given a, a park. We have our speeches and, uh, and all that. In addition, in addition 
to marching through the historic part of London, through our capital, the very political part. Incidentally, for those of you who are history buffs, when we lay our wreath at the Cenotaph, just a few yards up the road, just a few yards up Whitehall, is the spot where King Charles I, in 1649, had his head chopped off, in front of a huge crowd, by the way. That's just up the, a few yards up from the Cenotaph. It's a very historical, then a little bit further you got to Balga Square with Lord Nelson. In addition to marching <coughs> through with our drums beating and the flags flying, in addition to marching through the historical heart of London, Britain, we also march through part what you could call the Black Heart of Britain. The Black Heart of Britain. Have you ever wondered, these decisions, these decisions to flood us with millions of ungrateful foreigners, these decisions they give millions of foreigners the vote in this country so they can vote their kind in to becoming mayors of our towns and taking us over. Have you ever wondered where the decisions to, to, to deliberately cover up for the rape of those girls up here, those underage children, where for years and years and years we now know the authorities, the Labour councillors, the Labour authorities, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats all knew of those crimes and deliberately, cold-heartedly covered them up because they didn't want to reveal to the public what, what the reality of the multiracial nightmare that they were setting up. Have you ever wondered where those decisions were made? Where men and women sat round tables and said, this is what we'll do. Well, when we march down Victoria Street, just off to one side are the political headquarters of the Conservative Party the political headquarters of the, of the Labour Party and the political headquarters of the Liberal Democrat Party. And that's the black heart of that's the black heart of Britain. That's where these that's where they that's where these heartless, shameless politicians make their decisions. They're made in London and they're made at those HQs or those party HQs. And when we march down through Victoria Street, Standing up straight, bang, 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 the drums banging, flags flying. We, our march is watched by the good, the bad, and the ugly. And they all, they, they understand the significance of the name National Front. It's got a great history, and a great, it was set up by A1 Army Generals, Air Commodore, Royal Navy Admiral, Oxford academics set this party up 50 years ago because they had the measure of the rottenness at the top of this country. And when we march, all that lot, the good, the bad and the ugly, understand that we're going to clean this country up. So thanks very much for listening to me. Okay. <laughs>